We're starting our story of climate change in the 1950s when Ralph Keeling was just a kid and he used to go visit his father in his lab and Ralph still remembers what it looked like. Had all these uh, glass tubes and pumps whirring and uh, there was a cartoon on television called Felix the Cat who had this sort of mad scientist guy, Poindexter, who also had glassware that would occasionally blow up on him. My exposure to science consisted of that cartoon on television in my father's lab, and they were very concordant. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go to the laboratory. (laughs) Now, while Felix the cat was running in the background, the elder Keeling was working on this experiment that had nothing to do with climate science at first. Ralph's father was researching rocks, but for that project, he had to know how much carbon dioxide was in the air. And this was a problem, because at the time, there was no way to precisely measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So he had to invent something. And he did. A machine. Those were the noisy pumps that Ralph remembers. And this machine was a breakthrough because before that, we could only get really rough estimates of how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere. But Ralph's dad's machine, it was the first that could very precisely measure how much CO2 was in the air. It could measure carbon dioxide down to parts per million. What is parts per million? What does that actually mean? So, yeah, if you have a... um a million molecules of air, it means that out of those million, 315 are carbon dioxide molecules. It's a tiny percentage. Uh, Well, it's, yeah, it's small, but sometimes things that are in small abundance matter. And Ralph's dad, David, was just about to find out how important small things could be. In 1958, David's first measurement showed that there were around 313 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But he soon noticed that CO2 levels were creeping up. And up. And up. In 1969, a decade after he first started tracking it, he noted that carbon dioxide was up by eight parts per million. David knew this was no anomaly. He later described it as unmistakable. And this was because he wasn't just going on one measurement. He helped set up instruments in other sites around the world, in Hawaii, Alaska, New Zealand, the South Pole, and even over the Pacific Ocean. Some pilots were recruited to capture air samples during Air Force recon flights. By the mid-1970s, the fact that carbon dioxide was going up was a scientific certainty. But that doesn't mean it felt like a big deal. Some of David's colleagues even thought that he should stop measuring it. I think a lot of his colleagues thought, oh, you're nuts to keep that going. But David, he did keep going. He didn't know exactly what the increasing numbers would mean for the world, but he felt that the change he was seeing was important and something worth keeping track of. And so he realised that his, his work had a different kind of importance because if he abandoned it, humanity would not know what was happening right now and that ought to matter. And then, in the late 1970s, scientists noticed another change. Teams all around the world saw that the average global surface temperature was rising too. Temperatures in the 1970s were about half a degree Celsius, or 0.9 Fahrenheit, warmer than almost 100 years before. And so, to explain it, scientists, including David Keeling, dug up this 100-year-old theory... You see, in the late 1800s, a Swedish chemist named Svante Arrhenius had come up with this idea that rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere can warm the planet. He knew that carbon dioxide could absorb heat from the sun. So he calculated that if we had more and more carbon dioxide, say by burning fossil fuels, it would absorb more and more heat, ultimately trapping heat inside the Earth's atmosphere and acting kind of like a blanket over our planet. 
But while a few scientists had pursued that theory back at the turn of the century, it hadn't really taken off. And that was pretty much because no one could measure carbon dioxide precisely enough to recognise the changes that were happening. That was until David Keeling invented that machine. But once David's data was out there, then his colleagues started thinking. Take this theory that Svante had, combine it with David's undeniable findings, and it was possible to explain why the world was getting warmer. Because of carbon. But there wasn't scientific consensus. In fact, a big National Academy of Sciences report written in 1983 said that while carbon dioxide was a compelling theory as to explain why the world might be warming, it was not yet confirmed as the culprit. Why? Because there were other suspects around. So, what were those other suspects? One of them was pretty explosive. Volcanoes. Some scientists thought that perhaps there hadn't been as many volcanic eruptions recently. Volcanic eruptions inject a whole bunch of junk into the stratosphere, ash, dust and sulphur dioxide. And this stuff reflects sunlight away from the Earth. It can, in fact, cool parts of the world down. In the 18th century, a volcano erupted in northern Europe for eight months, leaving the northern hemisphere about one degree Celsius colder than usual. So, some of those scientists noticing warming in the 1970s thought maybe fewer volcanoes were erupting and that was warming the world. To test this out, scientists looked through historical data and found that in the second half of the century, there actually were a bunch of eruptions in Mexico, the Philippines, and even more recently, in 2010, a volcano in Iceland spewed ash into the air for more than five weeks. Do you remember this one? It caused havoc to air traffic, as well as reporters who couldn't pronounce it. The glacier is called Ayafetla Yogurt. Ayafetla Yogurt. Just think of, hey, you forgot your yogurt. No, I've got it, I've got it. So in 2010, the Ayafetla Volcano spewed ash and dust in the air like other volcanoes recently. So, the number of eruptions hadn't changed on average, but the temperature of the world kept going up. So, scientists moved on. Some tried to find other explanations, pinning it on changes in how the Earth spins around the sun. Because the Earth can orbit just a touch closer or further away from the sun, sending our climate into a flux. Or perhaps it was changes in the sun's activity that was explaining this change in temperature. But the sun tends to power up and down in 11-year cycles, and the Earth's orbit changes over hundreds of thousands of years. They just didn't line up with the trends that scientists were seeing. So these were all ruled out too. Really, the big thing they kept turning back to was what that Swedish guy had said more than 100 years ago, that carbon dioxide was trapping heat from the sun and warming the world. And Ralph Keeling reckons that it's kind of incredible that this theoretical prediction from 100 years ago lines up with what we're actually seeing today. It's a triumph of science. It doesn't feel like a triumph for humanity, but it was a triumph for science. Back in Ralph's office, he showed me all the measurements that he and his dad have made. So you're looking at carbon dioxide starting in 1950. Almost 60 years of samples. And it's a graph with one line going up. And And it's now called the Keeling Curve. 315 parts per million, and they rise up to the right to something around 405 parts per million. 405 parts per million. So that's up 92 parts per million from when the Keelings first started measuring CO2. And when it comes to warming, the last three decades have each successively been the warmest decade at the Earth's surface since 1850. Okay, so thanks to the Keeling's work, we know that carbon dioxide is rising. We know that it's warming the world. 
But those facts alone don't mean that humans are responsible. So, how did science reach that conclusion? The thing is that carbon dioxide doesn't just come from burning fossil fuels. It's all around us. It's in the atmosphere. Humans breathe it out and plants absorb it when they grow. The oceans soak up and release carbon dioxide. In many ways, the planet is kind of constantly breathing in and out carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide is also pumped out when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil and natural gas. So, to find out whether more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was from the planet breathing or fossil fuels or something else, we have to investigate the carbon dioxide measurements that the Keelings and others have made. And this is something that Chris Field, a professor of environmental studies and director of the Stanford Woods Institute in California, told us all about. And the scientists kind of act like detectives. They use a variety of techniques, like on CSI. When was the last time you watched CSI? <laughs> oh, I don't know, is CSI even still on? <laughs> He's probably more into the good wife. And Chris has been studying the secrets of carbon dioxide for decades. And so how can we track what is carbon dioxide that's being farted out of trees and animals, and what is carbon dioxide that's coming from fossil fuels? It's really pretty easy, and I need to do a little mini chemistry lesson to help make this clear, but Wowie. there are, you can think about several flavors of carbon dioxide. Chris basically tells us that there are different types of carbon out there, and this may sound surprising, but there's carbon that's not radioactive, and carbon that is radioactive. <laughs> radioactive carbon disappears over a very, very long period of time. Now, anything on the Earth's surface with carbon in it has both kinds of carbon. It's got the radioactive kind and the non-radioactive kind. So, yes, you and me, we're all a little bit radioactive. And so are all the plants and the animals that you see around you. But there's something that doesn't have radioactive carbon in it. And that's fossil fuels. Why? Because fossil fuels are made of dead animals and plants that have been buried for millions of years. And during that time, all of the radioactive carbon inside of them slowly disappears. After millions of years, it's gone. Completely. So, when we burn oil and gas and coal today, they don't have any radioactive carbon left in them. Just that other kind of carbon. So when scientists like Ralph measure samples of air, they find lots of carbon that doesn't have any radioactivity, meaning it's carbon that's been smushed beneath the Earth's surface for millions of years. Of the human-released CO2, because it doesn't have any of this radioactivity. When Keeling started his measurements, we could tell really, really clearly, and we see the signal... And that's how scientists know where the carbon in the air is from burning fossil fuels or from the planet breathing. And that signal is really very, very clear. Using these measurements and other studies, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, announced in 2014 that there was enough evidence to say that it was extremely likely that the burning of fossil fuels was the main cause of climate change in the mid-20th century. And by the way, they also wrote that it's not just carbon dioxide causing all this trouble. There are other greenhouse gases, such as methane, which partly comes from cows belching, and nitrous oxides, as well as water vapour. And Chris says that if there was a big problem with this conclusion, at this point, we would know because scientists have been trying to poke holes in it for years. So every scientist out there is banging on this infrastructure of knowledge as hard as he or she can to find what's wrong with it. And nobody's found a flaw. Everybody fine-tunes. But everybody's trying to find that big flaw that would make him or her famous. So 
This is why 97% or more of climate scientists agree that warming trends are caused by human activities. 